We've had a lot of incredible guests join us um, over the years, or over the last year. It's 2019, so now it, I can say years, right? <laughs> yeah, that's right. And we are very humbled and honored to have Erica Lucas join us today. And I've got just an abbreviated um, resume of hers, as you can see. And it's really impressive. And if you don't mind, I'd just like to kind of read a couple things off just so people kind of, if they haven't gotten a chance to uh, get to know you, they can understand a little bit better. So Erica is the co-founder of Stitch Crew, which is a firm aiming to democratize access to resources and social capital to increase entrepreneurial participation in underrepresented communities. They've partnered with the Thunder Launchpad, which is an accelerator program you guys are probably familiar with. And fun fact, she was born and raised in Mexico. Mm -hmm. And uh, she started her career facilitating the establishment and successful operation of several international companies there. Um, from that, she went on to be a president of a private equity firm um, she was a global director at the Oklahoma Department of Commerce and brought in a lot of investments there and created a lot of jobs. Um, also a co-owner in a digital gym franchise, a co-founder in Lyft for Charity, and she's on more boards and chairs than I can Trying really to cover this year. tonight. So. <laughs> yeah. And so we're, we are very happy to have you on here. Uh, you have a lot of really cool stuff that you've done for the city. And um, with that, let's go ahead and give her a nice startup grind. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. So Eric, I, I kind of ran through uh, the last X amount of your years pretty quickly there. Is there anything else that you'd like to share with us to, to kind of tell us a little bit more about Not yourself? Not really. I mean, um, I think you covered it pretty well. Um, I'd love to tell you how. <laughs> I love kind of your focus on the grind because it might look pretty on paper, but um, it was not a, a straight up ladder or journey, um, even to what we're doing now, helping other entrepreneurs, so. One, yeah. one thing on, on your background that really stuck out to me is the born and raised in Mexico, mm -hmm. and now you're here in Oklahoma City. What what was that transition like growing up there, living here? I'm sure a lot of us probably struggle to identify with what that might look like. Can you share maybe what it was like from your perspective? Yeah, so um, I actually, the first time I migrated to Oklahoma was with my mom and uh, my sister. Um, and she was a single mother and she came here with her sister um, to give us a better shot. Um, and it was great. Um, it wasn't for me. I love Mexico, love living there. So um, stayed here, did two years here, and then I decided to go back to Mexico and live with my grandparents. Um, and so did um, school over there, and then I actually started my career very early because I learned English. I haven't lived here. <laughs> so I actually, um, that's how I got that job, helping other international companies. It wasn't because I was super smart or, you know, I didn't have the pedigree. I still don't have the pedigree. It was because of my English, um, and I was able to relate and communicate with the CEOs that were looking at Mexico for investment. And so I um, did that, and then I came to visit my mom because she stayed. She and my sister uh, stayed. She got married here and, and is still living here. And so I came back and visited her over the summer, and um, or January, I guess it was, um, and then met my husband. And I couldn't convince him to go back to Mexico with me, so uh, so he convinced me to stay here. Maybe so. maybe for vacation. Oh yeah, for sure. <laughs> Every year we still go back. Great, great. Um, so did you? You went to school there. Did you go to mm -hmm. college there? Did you? Go I, here? I went to college. I did not graduate college. Um, awesome. I'm I'm not the typical like you know college degree. Um, yeah, it wasn't for me. Um, but hey, here you are. <laughs> yeah, no, You're on our uh, show. <laughs> yeah, no. I actually started working. So I did. I did. Um, here's the story. I, so I was doing college. Had to pay for it myself. Um, and so the way to do that, I started teaching English classes to executives on Saturday mornings. And so that's how I met the uh, gentleman that ended up hiring me for American Industries because I was teaching him how to speak. English and he was like, "Do you want to? Do you want to come work with us? This is what we do. We mainly work with American companies that are looking to invest in Mexico, and you know we do a lot of communication. We host them, we show them around." I'm like, "Sure, why not?" 
And so I started working with him and just love what we were doing, love what, what, what I was exposed to, and I just, um, I left college at that point. Hmm. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. So, and now today you are um, running the Thunder Launchpad and you're working with UR Stitch Crew mm -hmm. and you guys are helping elevate these, these companies and help them grow and accelerate them. Um, but before you got there to where you are now, you had a, a few companies of your own that you started and grew. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, so the entrepreneur in our family started with Chris, so that's my husband. So he's really the entrepreneur, and um, he started a couple of companies. Um, Coco Fit Club was one, um, probably the most successful one or the ones that they know him for the most. Um, so he went to Boston, met with the founders of the company, and it, we were actually the second franchise to open in the country. This is before Fitbits and all the technology and like how to track your workout and all of that stuff. So it was pretty rev revolutionary uh, to do it. And um, and he cut a deal with them and, and decided to bring it to Oklahoma, one of the unhealthiest states <laughs> at the time. And still, we're still struggling in that. But um, I think it was pretty bold of him to do it um, because normally you partner with franchises when they're successful and they have a proven model that you don't have to figure out how to do, right? That's the value of doing a franchise. So you typically don't go in when you have to be the second one op that opens in the nation. But he did that, and then he actually helped. Then he, because he was one of the early adopters, um, he grew it. We at one point we had like five locations here in Oklahoma, but then he started working a lot with corporate, and then grew the the franchise um, the franchise footprint by like I think 122 franchises all throughout the nations and in Canada. So. So, so that was one, and then Live for Charity, and then he did Tote for Me, and some of them failed terribly. <laughs> so um, so we did those back and forth. Mm -hmm. So you put Oklahoma, the unhealthiest part of it, as an opportunity <laughs> rather than as a threat in your SWOT analysis? 100%. <laughs> that's, that's how he saw it. Again, he, he is the entrepreneurial, the risk taker. I actually, as you probably saw in my, my background was more, most of my family in Mexico are entrepreneurs. So I actually did see the part that you don't see now in Hollywood, the hard part of being an entrepreneur. How are you going to pay your bills? And are you going to make this work? And who do you hire? Who do you fire? And, 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 and all of that. And so I saw all of that in my mom, um, single mom with uh, different uh, uh, businesses that she had, my grandpa. Um, and I didn't want to be an entrepreneur. I wanted to work for the man <laughs> or the woman, preferably, um, and just have a, a, a corporate ladder type of uh, journey. Um, and so that's what I did. Um, so I've always been the most um, risk um, mitigator in our family, where he was just like, take the opportunity, find the opportunity, take it, and then go for it. Probably makes a nice compliment. You've got a risk it taker did. and a risk mitigator. So. Yeah, it did. It that's did. great. So uh, what were those times when you guys maybe uh, failed in, in growing some of those companies? What, what kind of lessons did you learn from that? Well, I mean, even in Coco, there's no business, um, even the big ones that you see nowadays that don't go through some sort of failure. So, I mean, even Coco Fit Club and, you know, again, being the second one going in, we had to learn how to do a lot. Um, a lot of you know positioning ourselves like how do you brand this how do you market this how do you we were getting support from corporate but they didn't know what they were doing either so um, so just learning some of those um, we opened some facilities and places that we thought if they were cool and happening and this is going to be the perfect location and it just ended up not being so um, it was again it was before the Fitbit it was before um, our um, average cost of our membership was also very high. Um, and we were charging $90, I believe, for um, monthly membership when your average gym charges $10. So all of that was very new for Oklahoma. Now you have Orange Theory and wonderful uh, facilities, but before then it was very new. So kind of going through that, uh, even though we grew it to five facilities, it, it, there was a lot of failures and a lot of lessons learned in between. So what led you guys to starting up Stitch Crew and partnering with Thunder for the launch pad? 
Yeah, so um, a couple of things. So because Chris has been doing this for a while, he really has been mentoring uh, founders for a long, long time. We were just doing it on a volunteer basis. My background is, again, as you can see, has been more dealing with investors and, um, and in private equity with latter stage investments at that point. Mm -hmm. So we would come back and share stories of what I was experiencing and my uh, pet peeves with, with what I had to deal with investors and, and the companies that we were um, acquiring. And then Chris would come home and tell me his experience with founders not raising capital or the lack of availability of, of, of funding um, in our region. Um, and then we would share the crazy stories and we're like, there's got to be a better way to connect resources and, and figure out a better way to, to serve um, and grow the startup community here in, in Oklahoma. And so, um, and, and at the time, I, honestly, I was getting a little bit burned out with the company I was with um, in the private equity sector. And then I started toying with venture capital would be a lot more of my suit because you're working with companies and you're helping them grow and scale as opposed to with the private equity, you're purchasing companies and dealing with turnarounds often, you know, getting rid of te teams, hiring new ones and all of that. And so it wasn't as, as um, exciting, I guess, for me anymore. Um, so, um, so what we started doing is we started developing a lot of the relationships with the uh, investors that we already had through the private equity, but that were raising funds for venture capital. And what's happening in, the, in both coasts is that um, you know there, there's a lot of VCs and a lot of startup um, communities, but it's also saturated. So they started looking for deal flow in the Midwest, and so that's I started noticing that trend and, and having those conversations. And then Chris was already doing some consulting, so we said, you know, let's let's stitch together and let's stitch the. the you bring the founders, I bring the investors. And so that's what we started doing. And um, we had great relationships with the Thunder. And again, and having drinks one evening, um, Brian, who is one of the executives with the Thunder, was saying, how come? And we were sharing how we were working in Utah and Austin and other um, tech hubs. And they were asking, what are we lacking here in Oklahoma? And I said, well, you know, it's not that we're lacking. Maybe it's just that we need to give it a platform and just more. Mm -hmm. um, pay more attention to it. But we did say one of the ways that we get deals or we meet entrepreneurs and investors at the same time is through accelerators, private accelerators. that are not necessarily attached like a government entity or a, or a university mm -hmm. because they, they get to bring everybody right together. And so they were like, well, that's great. Let's run one. And uh, because at the time, I think they were thinking about the space. By the way, I, I want to clarify. So the Thunder Launchpad is the space in which we operate, and it's a great space. If you guys haven't been, I, I invite you to go. But um, it's a great space that, that the Thunder um, owns and operates. Um, and then the Accelerator program, it's what we run. So it's one of the programs that we run within the space um, at the Thunder. But um, at the time when they approached us, they were thinking of maybe just doing like an innovation hub, a, a space where they do a lot of stuff even outside of the accelerator, um, coding for kids and, and a lot of stuff that they already do with Thunder Care, Cares. And so, and we were more in the entrepreneurial community and they wanted to play in that. So that's kind of how we came up with the idea of launching the accelerator. That's great. Yeah. And I, I noticed we've seen some of your alumni in the crowd and mm -hmm. kind of see, see, have some of them on the show too. Do you have any success stories that you can share about people that have gone through your uh, accelerator program? Oh my gosh, yeah. Well, I'll share the ones from the from the people that are here, but obviously, um, Nodecraft, with, uh, with, um, who also houses here in this awesome space, is in the back. Um, but they are amazing. It's an amazing story of a company that that. Um, by theory, shouldn't really exist in Oklahoma. They're a gaming uh, uh, startup uh, who has defeated all of the odds, uh, self-funded, bootstrapped. Uh, they are uh, uh, revenue plus um, a company, great team. Um, they leave and breathe all of those good values that you kind of reinforce here of like building a diverse team and um, grinding and doing and being focused and, and um, doing the right things and scaling the right way. So I, I consider them a success story and I know they're going to do great things here in the future, in the near future. And then um, up here in the front we have Veribus Labs, which we adore as well. They um, 
are doing, uh, uh, they're making it easier for families with cerebral palsy um, kids or patients um, to do therapy at home. So right now, and that just touches my heart because our youngest daughter also has CP. And so we experience the problem that they're trying to solve firsthand in that it's great to do therapy, to take the, the, your loved one to therapy all the time, but sometimes it gets cumbersome. And then most of the progress that it's made, it's, it's really in, um, continuing to do the exercises at home. But the kids don't want to do that. I mean, they're boring and you know they, they don't remember to do it. But what they're trying to do is bring virtual reality into play so that the kids, it's, they're making a game out of it. Gamifying it. So uh, yeah, so the kids now get to play games, get to enjoy it. Um, but then the cool thing too um, within technology is that you can actually send all of that data back to the therapist so that they can track everything um, that, that the kids are doing. They can track the progress, monitor all of that, which can potentially help them get more insurance money. Anyway, I don't want to uh, break the cycle here, but um, they're, they're doing a great job, and, and I think that they're also going to be a great success. But you know, as you said, um, success stories um, are not overnight, so it's going to take time. So I keep telling that to everybody that's watching the accelerator very quickly. It's like, well, who's raised how much money and who's hiring all these people? And I'm like, they just graduated. <laughs> Give it a sec, you know. Yeah. But um, yeah. but they're doing great things, and we believe 100% in them. That's great. That's great. What other types of uh, stuff are you guys doing with the accelerator? And I always see you guys having these these great talks and chats in the news, and it's. Uh, it's great to have you guys with with us today. So. Yeah, yeah. Um, so the accelerator. Does anybody know what the accelerator is, or how it differs from incubators? So basically, we. Um, and there's nowadays the, the the whole accelerator industry is actually a new industry started in 2005 by YC uh, Combinator in California. Um, now there's so many of them all over the world and and you have for-profit accelerators and nonprofit but basically what they are is that they connect technology primarily technology entrepreneurs with resources and capital uh, for-profit accelerators would do it in exchange of equity so if you go through their accelerator they'll give you cash in advance but then they take equity of your company um, we decided for many reasons um, to run ours as a nonprofit. So by going through a program, you don't uh, get to give equity. Um, and instead of giving you a cash uh, or a check, uh, we actually give you resources. We can talk about that later. But, but basically how we do it, we host the founders and cohorts. So we do two a year, up to 10 companies per cohort. And while they're in the program, they get access to mentors, corporate perks that we have. We're actually part of GAN, which is Glo the Global Accelerator Network. Um, so we're part of like a community of 105 accelerators throughout the world. So we get to share mentors, corporate perks, et cetera, and, and the founders have access to that. And so the average uh, savings that we're seeing from founders going through a program uh, to take advantage of all of those assets, it's about $20,000 um, to get their company off the ground. Um, so anyway, uh, the program lasts 12 weeks. Uh, we do one in the spring, which by the way, if you don't mind, I have to plug it in. Um, we're actually um, recruiting founders right now, so the application is live on our website, um, and it will close January 31st. So, um, But yeah, that's what we do. What, what website can people find you at? At uh, stitchgroup.com. So if you just go to stitchgroup.com and then just click on the accelerator, um, you'll find all the info. So what's it been like running an accelerator in Oklahoma? Uh, have you gone to talk with other people that run those outside of the state and what are the differences? What what do we need here or what, mm -hmm. what can you share with us about that? Um, it, 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 it's really been a thrill and, and um, because we get to see the founders. So, you know, the biggest asset that you have to build a, a thriving, you know, startup community, I think it's the founders. We got that. I mean, great example is Notecraft and, and Bob here with Veribus. And, and so that's the, the biggest asset we have it. We have a lot of talent in Oklahoma. Um, I think that when we first came out, a lot of people were like, hmm, what are you doing? And what's the intent? And what's this pay it? pay it for, or, you know, uh, give first, get late. So nobody believed yeah. what we were doing, and there's got to be a catch to this. So it, it was very new for Oklahoma. And we had a lot of people that, um, and understandably so, um, just wanted to figure out how we would 
add value to the ecosystem. Um, so, so it's been it's taken us a year to uh, build relationships, to figure out how we complement programming and how we complement resources, uh, how we help each other out. Um, so we're getting there, I think. Um, I think we need to put the founders uh, first all the time, and and I'll, I'll always think of them first, um, and and we'll get there. Um, yeah. So obviously operating as a facilitator between these founders and these um, investors, you've got to learn a lot about Oklahoma's startup economy. Mm -hmm. um, what have you learned about it? Where, what type of resources do you recommend or what can founders do to position themselves to be more um, attractive to investors? You know, I, I think it, it depends because I, sometimes investment is not, not the right what, solution. What they, yeah. yeah, not what they need or what. I, I, so the first um, question that we ask or the first thing that we do when when the companies that are going through a cohort um, go through is this exercise of, of understanding what kind of company you want to build, uh, how fast you want to build it, um, are you okay uh, taking equity? Um, uh, capital because it's some of the most expensive capital, right? You're given uh, portions of your company. Um, and so understanding those dynamics and then making your own decisions based on your lifestyle, best, based on what you want to build, um, it's great. Um, but for those companies that are raising capital, um, it is challenging. Um, there's a lot of wealth in Oklahoma, but it tends to be deployed in um, areas where investors feel comfortable with. Um, so it's either a latter stage, the private equity, so acquisitions, um, turnarounds, M&As, um, and or tends to be in real estate, oil and gas, things that they're comfortable uh, making those decisions. So, um, so for founders, startup founders, particularly in technology, um, I, I can see the challenge because there's not that much investment going into, into startups right now in Oklahoma. So it might be better for those to, to bootstrap or to know which path that they should go down. Yeah, or or raise capital from outside of Oklahoma. It's okay. I mean, yeah. and that's actually we encourage that. You know, um, because even in other areas, um, the the key I think is knowing what kind of company you're building. If you're going to raise capital from who you want to raise it with from, I'm sorry, and then do your research to see which investors you want to partner with, right? And then and then and then reach out. To as many as you can, <laughs> because it's also a numbers game and a luck. Uh, you know, you have to be lucky too. Um, a lot of investors, although there's a lot of like LinkedIn profiles with investor and angel investor, VC investors, very few actually are, <laughs> or very few are actually deploying funds. Um, nowadays, everybody is an investor. So, um, understanding that there is scarcity even in the big tech hubs, because even the big tech hubs, like um, now in VC, particularly. Particularly, depends on who you reach out to, but they're they're not investing in companies that are not um, making at least one million dollars in revenue a year already. So just understanding where you are and who who you need to reach out to if you want to go after angel investment, seed investment, if you're ready for VC capital, understanding all of that and being very um, well versed in it um, would help you and will go along the ways. And you don't have to raise it just here locally. It helps a lot. You don't have to. What other type of advice would you give to entrepreneurs that are either beginning their journey or um, starting to continue their journey in in this area? Oh my gosh, um, that's a, a lot. But I guess we've the, got thirty minutes. Yeah, yeah. So. <laughs> um, I think the biggest uh, deal would be to focus on on your startup. You know. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of people think it's cool to build a company because, uh, you know, the media tends to romanticize with it. And, and, and it is cool. I mean, come on, founders are cool, <laughs> uh, regardless of whether they win or fail. So I don't want to take that away, but, but it's a lot of hard work. 
And also when you're a founder, you get distracted a lot because then people want to get to know you either to sell you stuff or to, or to get you to speak at their events or to get you to participate at networking. So networking and meetups are great, but you also have to stay focused. Like your company has to come first because if you don't succeed, they're not going to keep asking you to do all of those things. So, so I, I always say, you know, focus is a new IQ and um, particularly for startups is just being able to, um, your, your first priority is to to um, your employers, to your team, to your employees' team, um, and and building that company. Um, and so, understanding that not every shiny object needs to distract your attention from that, I think it's important. It's it's one of our first rules that that we um, try to. And then uh, one of our other rules is break every other rule because you need to make your own rules <laughs> based on what you're building. So, um, but no, it's one of the first things that we tell the founders that work through our program. You know, while you're here, make the best out of it. Focus 100% on your startup and, and put everything else aside except for family. Slight variation of the Fight Club rules. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. That's great. Um, what else can you share with us about Oklahoma's startup economy and Obviously, there's there's a lot of resources for for those out here. You know, there's accelerators, there's coking spaces, mm -hmm. there are are an amplitude of, of resources and a myriad of those that that people can find to um, operate as a, a support system for them and, and their journey. Uh, anything in particular that comes to mind for you or? Yeah, no, I mean, you know, um, that's one of the things that we also say. Um, if you want to, um, if success was based on um, you know, avail available resources, then everybody would be successful because nowadays with the internet, you can pr pr pretty much find anything. So um, I think the best programs out there are the ones that create community and that enable you to network with other people and um, and uh, help you to focus, um, give you connections to what you otherwise wouldn't have access to. Um, I think those are it, but I mean, you know, it depends on what you're building too. I mean, there's I2E for investments um, here in the state. Um, there are the, um, you know, the innovation hub at Norman. Um, if you want to build something and you need to build a prototype, um, yeah. I mean, so there, there's a, a lot of resources um, and all eager to help founders. Um, I think the biggest. Um, advice here then is to figure out what it is that you want to build. Make sure that you're actually solving a problem because another thing that we see is that um, we have a lot of technology enthusiasts that fall in love with technology um, and they want to build a product thinking that nobody else has it or that they're going to be the only ones that have it, but it's really not solving a, a problem or a niche in, in an industry or for the consumer. So understanding all of that, because if you understand that, if you understand what you're building, who your consumer is, who you're solving the problem for, why you're the right person to do it, if you know all of those, then it's easier for you to say, you know, Stitch Crew is a better uh, program for me at this stage, or maybe I should start um, here, or maybe I should go here. Um, it, it would help you identify because now you know what you're building, um, and and now you just need to figure out how to build it and who can help you build it. That's great. So, in in addition to staying focused on their craft and uh, kind of putting the blinders on and avoiding those shiny objects, what other types of struggles have you seen? people going through your accelerator's experience and what type of advice would you perhaps give those that might have ex experienced similar struggles? Um, I mean, I think that one of the biggest struggles is, you know, when you're a founder and you're just in the early days, you're doing everything. And so you don't have a lot of capital, you don't have a lot of resources, you don't have staff, um, you know, so you have to that's why it's so important that you focus and that you only do the stuff that really makes the difference. Um, but um, one of the biggest struggles is figuring out how to manage all of those little things that need to happen while grinding, while doing the side hustle because you, you're not bringing revenue in, while taking care of your co-founders and employers, while fundraising. Um, so um, it's... it's um, it, it's having to be the, you know, everything and, and having to do everything. Um, and at the same time, taking care of yourself. So self-care is something that we take very seriously at, at Stitch Crew and our, our, our accelerator because, um, you know, as everybody probably knows, um, 
it's it's 80% mental and 20% mechanics. So if you're not well um, and and strong um, here, it, it's not going to work out. So that's, that's a great point. I think it reminds me a lot of how it seems like today's startup culture romanticizes to steal your word from earlier the hustle and the grind of I'm going to give everything that I got to this. I'm going to sacrifice all my things to make this work. Mm -hmm. And but really, that's probably the unhealthiest thing that you can do is is just to to not take care of yourself. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it it, it wears out. You know. I mean, it's going to wear you out, and and then you're going to give up on the company anyway because you're tired and you don't want to do it anymore. And um and and that's why it's so important. That's why we start the accelerator all the time. We're like, what do you want to build? Because the Silicon Valley model, where you have to um, build something and build it in three weeks and put it out there and fundraise and get the $2 million evaluation right away. I mean, that works for some people. That's what they want to do and they love and they have the adrenaline and they love to run that fast and, and all of that. But maybe you want to build a company that you want to pass on to your children. Therefore, you don't want to give out equity because you want to build it slowly and steady. And so understanding why you're building in, um, you know, and, and it, will it fit your lifestyle? Will it fit the way you want to live your life? Is it going to run you dry uh, pretty fast? Um, and are you okay living that lifestyle? I think it's really important. So self-care comes in um, big time on that on that end. So again, on the, the topic of self-care self and all of these different things that an entrepreneur needs to do and your giant resume and all the things that you're involved with and that you've done. How do you, maybe this is just more of a personal question of how do you manage your time? How do you decide what to focus? I know you're in a, in a stage where you're wanting to cast off some of those um, other responsibilities to focus on, on your core, but uh, how do you decide what's important to you and what to put your focus and, and effort into? Um, well, first of all, you, you first ask, like, you know, how do you, how do you balance or how do you manage? I don't. <laughs> Long story uh, short. I mean, I mean, it, it, you, do, you know, um, I love what we do. I love working with founders. I, I actually love working with investors as well. Um, and, and, and so it's hard because you want to do everything. And, and when you're really passionate and you know what drives you and, the, and you feel the energy, then, then you want to do everything. Um, I'm, I'm learning to remove myself from the operations a little bit more and become more of an owner. So learning to delegate and learning now that you have the team established and you kind of have the, the operations, learning to do that. Gabby in the back, have she's amazing. Strategizer. <laughs> yeah, and, and have people that if we have people that you trust to take care of, of the day-to-day -day and the operations of things. I'm learning to do that. I have, I have an issue. I think that most founders have an issue with letting go of control. <laughs> And so I'm learning uh, myself to do that. Um, but the way I prioritize, I do try to say, okay, what, what's going to move the needle? For Stitch Crew and for the accelerator, it's always, if it doesn't benefit the founders, we're just not going to do it. So that's our first rule. Um, so a lot of times we do get asked, like we get asked all the time, should we raise a fund? Um, should we become a for-profit accelerator and have our own fund so that we can incentivize? But not all of our companies need funding. So is that, should we instead partner with investors? So we're always, it's always like what benefits the founders. One of the reasons too, and we talk about like the ecosystem in Oklahoma, another reason why we decided to run the accelerator as a nonprofit, um, if you go to Crunch, uh, crunch uh, Base or um, Angel List and you look at the numbers of startups coming out of um, Oklahoma, it's not that many. And um, if you take into consideration our economy, we have less than 3% unemployment um, overall. Uh, we have a huge shortage of tech um, labor. So pretty much if you graduate from college, or even if you don't, and, and you are tech savvy, you're almost guaranteed a job with you know, one of the big ones, uh, Boeing, uh, Northrop, um, the oil and gas companies, you name it, and then you're going to have um, benefits and you're going to be cool, you're going to be okay. So why in the hell would you start a startup? <laughs> right? So we need to take that into consideration. So for us, it was always like, you know, and again, going back to like what benefits the founders, if we start, if we become a for-profit and we then start working with investors, our mindset has to change because now we have the fiduciary duty to our investors to make profit out of the companies. 
So we have to select different type of companies, right? We have to select the companies that we feel, and, and we, we begin to play this, I don't think everybody gets it right, so I don't think it's the right way to phrase it, but, but this whole picking winners and losers, right? Because you have to pick the best of the best, or the ones that you think are gonna make it, and most of the time, those are the ones that don't. Um, so we rather uh, get to know the people, and get to know, like, that's how we pick um, the companies that go to our accelerators, not because we have figured out an amazing formula of who are the most likely to succeed, but we pay attention on the founders and the team. And um, are they committed? And are they diverse? And do they understand the problem really well? Um, are they the right team to solve it? Do they have the commitment there? Are they gonna get up every day when, when things go south? Um, we try to assess the psychology and the strength of the team and the bench um, versus trying to figure out if they're gonna return a 10X, 100X return to the investors. So if we change, and, and I'm not saying that we won't, it, maybe next year we'll, we'll, we'll have a completely different structure, but it would change the way we currently operate. And right now, that's how we prioritize activity. And so running it as a nonprofit gives you that autonomy to, to pick your own winners, so to speak, on, on maybe those that people wouldn't be betting on as much. Uh, well, it, it helps us in a couple of ways. It helps us to create density, which I think is important. So at, at right now in Oklahoma, we need to be supporting more creation of new companies because we don't have that many, um, in my opinion, uh, startups, technology startups. Yeah, so, so once we have the, a portfolio. Exactly. So once you have density, then you can be more selective, and then and then you need, and hopefully, by the way, there's more accelerators that pop up, you know, maybe the, that are vertically focused or for-profit focused or whatever. But the, now, now you have the density, now you have the deal flow. So now you can say, okay, there needs to be an accelerator that works just with gaming companies and is for profit or whatever. There's an accelerator that works for oil and gas companies. Uh, right now, we don't have the density. We don't have the deal flow. Um, and we could try to attract from out of state, which is also another thing that we talk about a lot. And we actually, you'd be surprised of how many applications we get from out of state. Yeah. Um, I think the challenge is that to really make it like competitive against the big uh, accelerators like Techstars or YC um, or others, um, we're also, I love Oklahoma City and I love Tulsa and I think they're killing it, but we're, we're not there when it comes to destination sites, right? So like um, it's harder for us to compete with the for-profit accelerators that are more regional when they're based in Chicago. And then, you know, for founders, it's just like, oh, we're gonna go build our company in Chicago for, we'll get there. We're working with both mayors to, to get there. But, um, but those are some of the challenges that we look at and we, we have to play and, and be aware of what we have to work with. Um, and for us, creating density is more important at this stage. So you mentioned that you are trying to work with both mayors of Oklahoma City and Tulsa to get us to an elevated scene where we're more of a destination place for an accelerator or for just a person in general to start a company and grow a company. What type of opportunities or what things do we need here to take those next steps in your mind? Yeah, so um, the first thing I would say and the reason why we work with the mayors, we, we hosted a town hall last year um, with both uh, mayors and it was great. Um, collaboration is huge um, between, pro uh, like for example, what you guys are doing is amazing for the startup community, um, bringing everybody together, um, providing, because I think you're touching not just entrepreneurs, but aspiring entrepreneurs, maybe people that are t haven't yet figured out if they want to. Yeah, entrepreneurs. Uh, um, I like, there's, uh, well, uh, I have a, actually we have a, maybe I shouldn't say this, but um, we do have a, a a, a way when we're evaluating companies where we say this is a social enterprise, this is a entrepreneur, this is a an aspiring entrepreneur, and and, and this is a high growth like investable. Uh, anyway, but we have a joke about entrepreneurs. But yeah, <laughs> we we can edit out for the the final video, but we are live streaming, so <laughs> <laughs> yeah. it, that's not the most outrageous thing I've said. So, cool. um, but yeah, um, so no, but collaboration is huge. Um, moving away from, you know, uh, this is Tulsa startup scene, this is Oklahoma startup scene. Um, it should just be one startup community. Um, in fact, we should be regional 
we're actually hosting, um, so this is another plug, we're hosting an accelerator that's coming in from Colorado Spring that wants to uh, talk to some of the companies, and we're like, yes, absolutely, talk to them, and they are for profit, so it's more of an invest investment play, but um, we, we need to, if it benefits the founders, then who cares who gets the credit, right? And so that's that's how we make decisions. And so when they said, hey, we're doing a road show, we'd love to make Oklahoma, would you help us? Uh, and we're like, yeah, absolutely. Um, so I think that um, collaboration and just understanding that um, people like us, we're support systems. We're not the stars, the stars are the founders. So what can we do to provide them a better chance of success um, for the future. And once we do that, I think um, I think the founders will do the rest. That's great. And so you mentioned um, you know, wanting to do this for the founders first and putting them first. And there's Tulsa and there's Oklahoma City. And it's important for us to realize that for us as a state to win, we need to be more collaborative. And that reminds me a lot of the terminology that seems to be going around the ecosystem of silos and we need to break down those silos and again that's a lot what we've been trying to do with Startup Grind and bring people together and um, it's great when people recognize that you win more whenever you work together with, with other agencies because ultimately we need to uplift the founders and I think that's great that you guys really put that as your rule number one. So. Um, before we jump into questions and answers, is there are there any last parting thoughts that you'd like to share with us or any of our viewers watching online? Not really. I actually love answering questions. So I hope there's there's some more dialogue. So I'd rather jump into that if yeah. that's okay. Yeah, well, we absolutely we've got 15 minutes for some Q and A, which is great. And um, if you would like to stay a little bit longer afterwards and talk one on one sure. with some people, you're welcome to do that. But uh, just to keep people on, on schedule, we'll try to stick to 15 minutes. Do you guys have any questions? Greg, I can always rely on you for a question. Always. Uh, Greg said no crap. And um, if, before, I'm gonna Kanye you right now, but I'll let you finish here in a second, but uh, <laughs> um, I hope he doesn't sue me. Um, anyway, after he asks this question, if you don't mind repeating it so that we can uh, yep, line here. it up. Yeah, sure. Yeah, uh, a, a comment and a question. So uh, I was telling my wife earlier tonight that uh, this Oklahoma City-Tulsa rivalry nonsense is just a Texan conspiracy. <laughs> and I'm not kidding. I mean, it's really, it's really quite really silly. But so here's a question for you. Um, in previous places I've been that you, you've been in, we've both mm -hmm. been in, et cetera, it was always a matter of getting the intro to the right VC. There was angels like dog fleas everywhere, mm -hmm. angels like thorns in your tires of your bicycle everywhere. Mm -hmm. Here in Oklahoma City, I just, I, I, I can't name three. Can you comment on that? Yeah, so, um, yeah, I mean, there is scarcity um, in the Midwest. In the, oh, I'm sorry, yeah, so the question was, um, Where's the angels? Where, are the, where are the angels, where are the investors uh, in Oklahoma? How can we know more about them? Um, there are some investors here. Um, when, when they're angel investors, not necessarily associated with the seed group, it's harder to identify them because more than likely they're funding their friends of friends. And, you know, it's, it, again, is one of the reasons why Stitch Crew exists because we believe that, you know, if you, weren't born in the right family with the right connections, it's harder for you to raise money from friends and family, which is another, which is how most startups get funded at the beginning is through uh, friends and family rounds. One of the things that we're very conscious of in Stitch Crew is that, um, you know, we, we, we always say we, we're looking for the underestimated funders, which often include uh, minorities and female founders, um, because out of, um, all the investment that gets spent across the board, particularly in VC, only less than 2% goes to minority founders and less than 1%, or less than 2%, I'm sorry, to female founders and less than 1% to Hispanic and, and um, African American founders. Um, but that's not exclusive to them. I mean, it's just in general, if your family doesn't have the wealth and the means to give you $20,000 to get your startup off the ground, it doesn't matter how great of an idea it is. Uh, banks are not gonna, less than 80% of startups ever access traditional financing. So the, the traditional model for banks um, is just not suitable for startups. And it's not the bank's fault, fault either. It's, um, I mean, there are ways that 
and we're <laughs> trying to talk to them about that. But um, you know, nowadays that the way um, the the community banks um, that are more community and smaller, um, they're even um, they're going away either through acquisition, bigger banks are acquiring them. They're, so that, that's a challenge. But even with community banks, um, providing loans that less than um, $100,000, it's it's not profitable for them. Mm -hmm. And so there's like this huge funding gap then for, because the average um, across the board um, for startups, not for everybody, but for most, is $30,000 to get your startup off the ground. Um, and so for banks to kind of look at those, you need micro loans and you need stuff like that. And we just don't have, um, we, we, we don't have the density of, of investment um, and funding for startups in, in Oklahoma. So it, it's harder to identify. Um, we are keeping a list. We haven't made it public yet because we're still trying to add and, and give the opportunity for those that want to be exposed to, to deal flow, the opportunity to opt in. But we are keeping a list of investors and we want to democ. I mean, part of our deal is we want to democratize it. There's no more like, oh, this is my list and this is your, no, we, we're going to make it open. and. Here are the people, if they're willing, if they want to see deal flow and they want to see DEX, here it is. Go pitch to them. You don't have to go through our accelerator. You don't, here they are. Um, so, um, but yeah, I, I hope that answers your question. Oh, sure. I was just wondering if you had any insight or any big secret amazing plans to fix it. Somehow. You know, I, I, here's, here's what we think and what we're vetting on. Um, when Nodecraft um, raises their next fund and exits, um, people are going to feel like they should have invested in it. Um, and that's going to create a competitive landscape. And people are going to want to get into cap tables. Right now, um, investors don't understand that, local investors don't understand that um, it, it, they could get into cap tables now at a much cheaper uh, raid than in other areas, um, invest in great companies, and, and they just don't see the value because there's not uh, there's not that many. And they, they, they you, so we need to work. So it's the chicken and the egg, but we're betting on the egg, which is the startups, um, right? So uh, as they continue to grow and as they continue to be successful, which I'm, I have no doubt that they will, um, I think investors are going to start realizing that they're missing out on their cap table. So I, it, that's what we're betting on. Just uh, you know, that's why it's important that um, another reason why we launched the accelerator as nonprofit is let's create density. Let's figure out okay. So even if we're not investing, even if we don't have the investors here, who can we partner on a regional or national level that wants to see the deal flow, that wants to invest? Um, hopefully through the program, we help the founders figure out who those people are, reach out to them, make connections, um, and then get them funded or get them going. Um, and then investors are going to start paying more and more attention. Um, the appetite also has to grow. I mean, right now, investors, um, startups are risky. Um, it, it's just the nature of it. Um, but in our opinion, it's riskier to pass on, on, on startups, right? Um, and, and it's just, it's a cultural shift that I think needs to happen with uh, local investors. Um, but I think they'll come around. There's a lot of wealth in Oklahoma, and I think they'll come around when they see that they're losing out on opportunity. Great input. Do we have any other? Yes. Can you predict, predict Erica, approximately when you'll have the density you're talking about? Mm -hmm. No. <laughs> no. Um, well, I'd be a lot. <laughs> uh, I hope so. <laughs> I hope so, Steve. Yeah, good to see you. Um, uh, you uh, Can we no, predict when uh, that will happen? Yeah. You know, it, it's a funny deal because um, we, we're actually a great place to do business. Um, Barbara can tell us about that all day long. Um, we, in terms of uh, cost of doing business, we do have a lot of lifestyle businesses um, that sometimes don't think that they could scale or that they're a technology company. I tell everybody, everybody's a technology company nowadays. <laughs> Figure out how you can grow it if you want to grow it um, and put your damn company on Crunchbase, even if you're not looking for investment money, because that just helps us figure, hey, there's companies coming out, and that's how investors also start paying attention to regions. Mm -hmm. I mean, we, we have great relationships with Revolution and Steve Case Fund, um, the Steve Case Fund, um, um, and uh, Rise of the Rest, and, and, and Village Capital, and all of them. But the thing that they say is they, they that's how they go. They go to those lists, and then they see how many, and until we get that density, they're not 
it, it's not going to be a priority for them, right? Mm -hmm. Because they also have to prioritize where they focus on. Yeah. So, um, so we, we do have the businesses. I think that getting together the business, that's why community is so important, like getting the business together, talking to each other, understanding kind of the innovation economy and how even if they're not seeking investment, it would be great for them to have those profiles for their business to get national recognition. Um, how do we teach businesses to do better at telling their story, not just on the local level. I mean, Tulsa, we're all love them and, and Oklahoma, that's great, but on a national level, how do we use um, social media to get a better reach um, and, um, and all of that. I think that that's going to make the difference. But um, how fast we can reach that density, perhaps we have it. We're just not telling the story um, or we're not connecting everybody. Um, yeah, that's a great point. And we'll go over here in a second. One comment I want to make on that is uh, when we brought in a, uh, a consultant to talk to us about what we need to get to that next level, I think one of the resounding uh, action items was for us to talk about ourselves more. Yeah. And I, as Oklahomans, I think that is kind of a bit of a struggle that we might have. Some people don't like to talk about themselves, so there's, others might, but we do definitely, we need to tell our story a lot more. Yeah. You know what I did notice, um, and I hope I'm not offending anybody, but um, when I, I, what, what I did notice when we first came out is that uh, so often we talked a lot about our own programs or like the ecosystem builders and the community builders, we like to talk about our programs and not the founders. <laughs> and it should be the other way around. Let's tell the founder story. Don't tell them who helped them and who helped, you know, when, when they make it big. But if we shift that focus, uh, would be good. Um, I think uh, because it's their story that we need to tell if they're solving a problem, if they're actually, you know, um, have built in a great product that everybody yeah. needs to know about. That's great. Vicki? Yes, hi. Um, what is the number that makes density? Is there a number of entrepreneurs? Is there a certain number on that site that you're talking about? How do we quantify that? Not, not, I mean, not really. I can tell you that at some point we were talking to a really large accelerator that charges communities to come and bring their program there, the millions of dollars to do it. And they said they need to see around 200 uh, startups popping up a year um, before they, um, they take a serious look at the, at the community itself. Um, whether that's the magic number or not, um, I don't know. I'm, I'm more interested in just, um, uh, you know, like last year, just in our program alone, alone, we saw 18 startups. And I think at the same event, unfortunately, I wasn't able to go, the one that you're referencing to, but I did hear that one of the questions was asked, can anybody in the audience name 10 startups mm -hmm. uh, here locally? And I think maybe one person was able to do it, but the rest weren't. Uh, that's a story I heard. I don't know if it's... That needs to change because we do have startups. We just need to, again, know who they are, connect them, make sure that they know each other and all of that. Yeah. I think we've got time for one more question or two more if we can keep it short. Um, so my question is, you've, you've spoken a lot about like tech companies. Um, what does your company do or what resources are there out there for companies that are either manufacturing or service-based that are starting up? Well, there's actually a lot of cool resources for manufacturing. We're a manufacturer. We're a corporate and a manufacturing uh, state. And so the Manufacturing Alliance is a great resource for product-based um, uh, uh, products. The um, career techs are amazing. We actually partner with career techs. We, we love what we're doing. The innovation hub at OU, um, if you want to get a prototype out. Actually, in Tulsa, there's a really cool, I don't know if they've all already launched it, but they were doing an accelerator program for product-based, like they help you get the prototype out, and they manufacture it for you and all of that stuff. I, I have to get back to you and tell you the name of, of the program. Um, but actually for manufacturing, um, Claire is here, and Claire also is a community builder. But you, you may know of other <laughs> programs uh, for manufacturing um, deals, but um, there's, there's actually a lot of resources and cool. There's a SBDA um, local here. I guess they're based in Durant, but they have like places all over. So um, when it comes to manufacturing, there's also actually a lot of resources. How do we get the manufacturing into this ecosystem, though? Because those are startups that maybe are viable for our density ratio. Mm. Mm. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, 
You know, it, it, so one of the challenges that we have, again, I, I mentioned that we are a corporate town. Um, most of our manufacturing facilities, even if they're mom and pop <coughs> manufacturing that started, you know, 10, 20 years ago, um, it, it, they're larger, so they're not really necessarily the startups. Um, and most of those are the ones that are working with the manufacturing alliance. And so maybe that's a very valid question. Maybe it's not the ones I'm talking about. But I would say um, partnering with um, people like the Innovation Hub um, and knowing who's applying for the program. Is anybody developing a prototype? Um, you know, and, and again, this collaboration of us, of, of the ones that run the programs to say, hey, are you interested in manufacturing people? Because maybe tell me that and the next time I see somebody and then connecting the dots and all of that stuff. But um, um, yeah. I also wanted to, before we go over here, have just a minute, I just want to give a, a selfless plug to Project 3810, yeah. who does do an accelerator here. Uh, oh, they an incubator. Also, an incubator. Excuse me, an incubator, and um, they have a lot of focus on the manufacturing as well, and a lot of experience manufacturing. So it's a great space for people that, once they're ready to, I believe, grow, um, yeah. to come here. When their so. Etsy business grows out of their house, they should come here. Yeah. When their you Etsy know, the, business grows the, out of their house, the <laughs> they should come here. Um, the Techs are, are a great resource. I'm sure you already work with them. But um, recently, I was at a, at a meeting with um, with a lot of the career techs, and, and entrepreneurship is going to be big for them. Um, they're starting to pay attention. They're starting to realize that they need to connect the dots and all of that and offer that as, as part of their curriculum. So partnering with them right away and letting them know that you're a resource, I think, would be great. Follow up. The organization you were mentioning in Duran is REI. They partner with SBDA and the Choctaw Nation to oh. do manufacturing directly into a free trade zone. So you can do export and combine mm -hmm. with other imports without having to pay taxes on imports, which yeah. now is a big thing. Yeah. Before it was only a small thing. Yeah. Now it's a big thing. Yeah. And not not REI the equipment, you know, <laughs> mm -hmm. thing, but the other REI. You can look at cool. right. Last question, John. <clears throat> what would you tell a founder who's considering going through your program but thinks they don't have what it takes? Or maybe their business couldn't be big enough. Oh, uh, for a yeah. Well, and please would, repeat the question for yeah, those Yeah, so the online. question was, what would I tell a founder that's considering applying to the program but doesn't think that they're ready or at the right stage to apply? I would say, please apply anyway. Um, I think that um, maybe there's not uh, some people here in the room, but they are uh, the hardest part of our job, for sure, by far, is when we have to tell founders that they didn't make it into the cohort. However, some of those same people that we didn't accept in the first cohort ended up going to the second cohort, and or we ended up helping them anyway. So a lot of times, I mean, we really do believe in helping people. So uh, we sent one of the applica applicants that applied to our first batch, she was great. Um, she was developing a product that I just loved it so much and wanted it to be in our program, but she was going to be better suited at an accelerator in New York. So I send her over there and I said, I'm so, I love you, you need to be over here as much as it pains me. But, but, but I would say just apply. Um, it doesn't matter if it's an idea, if it's a concept. Um, again, we focus more on the team and whether you're the right person to solve the problem that you're trying to solve. So go ahead and apply anyway. That's, that's a great question. Thank you, John. Yeah. Erica, it was so wonderful, such a delight to have you with us today. Thank you for spending your evening with us. We're so thankful for this. Um, can you guys give her a nice round of applause?